I am interested in these two problems that I think society is facing, climate change, species extinction, and thinking about the future, um, my future, my road to understanding here, actually takes me to the past. And I have been walking in the past, in the footsteps of others, in order to understand the future. And this journey began 20 years ago when I got to UC Berkeley. Uh, I became a member of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology on campus, which was founded in 1908 by Annie Alexander, a heiress of a pineapple fortune in Hawaii. She was obviously not a woman of, typical woman of her time. She was interested in natural history. She wanted to foster this interest, so she funded and founded the museum, and she picked a man named Joseph Grinnell to be the first director. Grinnell was the son of a physician who had taken him around while he was growing up to live on three Indian reservations. And so it was probably through that early contact that he had a love of natural history. And Grinnell, he had a vision when he was founding this museum, and he gave a great gift to California of a baseline. A baseline of where the animals were in the early 1900s. This quote hung on the museum wall. At this point, I wish to emphasize what I believe will ultimately be the greatest purpose of our museum. This value, however, will not be realized perhaps possibly for a century, the lapse of many years, assuming our material is safely preserved. And this is that the student of the future will have access to the original faunal conditions in California and the West wherever we work now. 1910. Wherever he worked now, well, that was pretty much all over California. Those dots are places where they went and they collected uh, birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians. Um, they were interested in how climate affected the distribution of species, and they kind of went everywhere. And not only did he leave tens of thousands of specimens that are environmental samplers of baseline conditions for pesticides, pollutants, what species eat, but they left field notes, shells of notebooks that recorded their information day by day where they went. And, you know, I often wondered, how did he manage to do this? Grinnell and I went and I did all the driving. And we never traveled one inch but when he had that notebook open and writing notes. The whole time he was taking a bird census wherever, wherever we went. And uh, we'd be sitting in camp and we'd both be skinning. Pretty soon he'd throw a rat over to me and say, here, Russell, finish this one up. And he'd, he'd just throw me the skin and pick up his notebook and start writing. And he said over and over, he, he said, put it all down. You may not think it's important, but somebody may. He was writing down the plants and animals that he saw, basically, and put them in the notebooks, and he said to Ward, you know, write it all down. You may not think it's interesting, but somebody will. And we were that somebody. And so, 12 years ago, we began the Grinnell Resurvey Project to go all around California in the footsteps of these people who surveyed the state from 1900 to uh, the mid-1930s. And we began in beautiful Yosemite National Park, going from the Central Valley up over the Sierras. It took us three years to retrace our footsteps there. Two years in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Two more years down in Kings Canyon Sequoia to cover the Sierras. We uh, spent a couple years resurveying birds in the Central Coast and the North Coast. And now we're down in the deserts of Death Valley, Joshua Tree, and Mojave finishing the Central Valley this summer, and next year into the wilds of the Los Angeles Basin. I hope we survive that one. <laughs> but um, our, our idea is to cover the state in order to get an understanding of these changes. And, you know, when we do this, we basically go back and we use similar kinds of techniques, identifying birds, um, 
using small mammal traps to, to trap, collecting some as specimens, re releasing the vast majority. But our goal here is to understand the distributions, and here we are in Lassen. You'll notice that we've upgraded our transportation over time. But camping, well, camping is still camping. It's still great to be out there and enjoyable. And um, what we were expecting to find was how climate change might have influenced the elevational distributions of these small mammals and birds. You know, would the warming climate push species up the slope? Well, in fact, we did sort of see that. We, we had about half, half the small mammals moving up the slope, but the other half were either staying where they were, and some were even moving down. And then the birds were showing similar kinds of patterns, but some species were doing, moving up in Yosemite, moving down in Lassen, and doing nothing in Kins Canyon and Sequoia. There was tremendous variation. This had our scratch in our heads until we recognized that climate change in California is lumpy. Climate change around the globe is lumpy. It's not happening at the same rate in exactly the same directions everywhere. And you can see here in these, in these pictures that uh, the south part of the state has been warming a lot. Average temperature or the minimum temperature, the minimum nightly temperature especially has been warming greatly. But up here in the North State, it's a little bit of a different story. Since Grinnell's time, there's actually this funny, I don't know, some vibrations here in the room, cooling the temperature a little bit. It's not warming as fast up here. And it's also relative to the other parts of the state, it's gotten a little rainier. So when we were seeing things moving down slope, it was because, in fact, temperatures hadn't changed as much and had been rainy and even cooled a little bit in some of these places. So this changing climate means that the North State here is going to play a very important role for biodiversity because it's not changing as rapidly as some of the other places. You're likely to be receiving some refugia species coming up from the South. You can have some pride in that. It's a different kind of refuge problem. Ref Okay, now, but some of our other parks aren't so lucky. We found pretty much all the species in these big national parks, but a number of our other parks have seen species go extinct. We are having a big climate change that influences these, uh, the wildlife in a lot of these places. Storms and fires of greater severity, urban encroachment, invasions of non-native species into, into our national park gems plants and animals disappearing, a public that's becoming more urbanized and sometimes doesn't understand the value of these beautiful places, and political pressures often from narrow interest groups that have led to underfunding and neglect in a lot of these parks. So this is what they face today, and that's what inspired our meeting that we organized last year on campus called Science for Parks, Parks for Science. And we did this to bring together people, in essence, to rethink these problems, but also because Berkeley was this launching point for the National Park Service. In a way, you could say America's two best ideas, national parks and public education, grew up together at UC Berkeley. Here's a picture in 1915 of a, a number of very distinguished looking gentlemen who attended this meeting that was one of the very first thinking about the problems of parks. Three of the first four directors of the National Park Service were Berkeley graduates. Um, many of the early scientists and interpreters, foresters, were all trained at UC Berkeley by Grinnell or others. And so there's this strong influence here that we wanted to come back and revisit and think about these problems and ask ourselves, what could we do about it? So how could we connect a couple dots here to move a couple of those wheels? So we thought that we could maybe create an institute, and that's what we're working to do. Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity. Why Parks, People, and Biodiversity? Well, people need parks. 
They need parks to recreate. They need parks to reconnect with nature. They need parks to understand their cultural heritage. Biodiversity needs parks. Parks offer some of the best refugia for these species to survive in. They're the only kinds of lands that we know are not going to be uh, perhaps developed into the future. And they offer the backbone of our conservation strategies. And parks need people. They need people to value them. They're going to be supported. So the idea of this institute was to bring these things together. Science for parks, parks for science would use the parks to produce science that would help them, but also allow parks to act as kind of control areas like they have in our Grinnell resurvey work. Parks and their neighbors, we have to understand how parks can get along with their neighbors. They're economic engines, but they're also sometimes a source of problems. We need new models of engagement. And speaking of engagement, we're looking to engage people in parks, especially youth. Um, they are our next ambassadors. So lastly, we want to extend this knowledge into public forums and training of different kinds. So as I think about sending you out the door here with a little more action, I thought I might give you my six C's of a little more action. I would have the seven C's if I was a little more clever, but I couldn't come up with number seven, so you're stuck with six C's tonight. Okay, what are they? Well, the first thing you can do is help create the next baseline for California as a citizen scientist. Probably many of you heard about citizen science. People are, in fact, taking their observations and reporting them into app apps on their cell phones, like eBird or iNaturalist or CalFlora, where you can record the things that you've seen, and those often, once they're verified by experts, become research-grade observations that are being used to understand how biodiversity is distributed now. You can even get an app to report where Bigfoot is the next time you're in the Trinities. Okay, cut your carbon emissions. We're all in this together. We're all producing carbon dioxide, which is a source of this problem. How do you do that? Well, reduce your electricity consumption. You know, you can turn the air conditioner down a little bit in the summer. Hey, put your clothes on the clothesline. You never know what your underwear might catch. <laughs> Chain your car trips. So that is, you know, do, do multiple trips together so that you're not just going back and forth. These are your biggest uh, footprints of carbon going into the atmosphere. Contribute to land conservation. How can you do that? Some of you might own land. You can manage some of it for biodiversity. It's likely to be an important place in this part of the state in the future, the way our climate is changing. If you don't own land, realize that you do own land. You're a part owner of our public lands. So make your voice heard. Please, no hostile takeovers of parks, but make your opinions about how they should be managed and how they should be funded heard. If you're shy, okay, support an organization that's trying to do that. Collaborate with us to help launch the Berkeley Parks Institute. We can certainly use your help. Cultivate the next generation of Earth stewards. That's our children. That's our youth. Get them outside. Help them to recognize the value of recreating outside and that they could actually use their cell phone to record biodiversity instead of just tweeting. Okay, and then last, see you soon in a park. Thank you.